I came from Seattle, Washington, so I think I went, except Sarah, one of my colleagues, there she is. She lives in LA, so she beat me by an hour. So today I want to talk to you about research and storytelling and how important it is to connect the two. Um, so <laughs> I was thinking, what is one of the most dry topics I could talk about? And cholera came to mind. Does anyone know anyone who's been affected by cholera? Anyone? Okay, so there's a purpose to my story, but cholera is a serious illness. Uh, India has actually had six cholera epidemics over a period of 100 years, from like 1815 to 1917, that killed 37 million people. It's a bacteria, and when it's ingested, it attaches to your small intestine, and people evacuate their bowels pretty rapidly and have rice water stools. I know this is a lot for post-breakfast, but it makes them dehydrated and stay uh, previously before uh, medical intervention. People died. It's a very serious illness. So I've given you some facts about cholera, but I want to tell you a story about cholera. In 1854 in London, there was a cholera epidemic and in a period of 24 hours, 600 people had died in a very small area. This is some of the clip art at the time. And the first picture shows holding up the water to look and see how clear it was. And that was one of the early tests. You hold the water, it looks clear, looks safe to drink, let's drink it. And at the bottom is a gentleman I'm gonna tell you about. His name's Dr. John Snow. He's the, modern of father, uh, the, mod the father of modern epidemiology, which is looking at population tracks and looking at community research to find out how diseases spread. There's a book based on this, 2006, called The Ghost Map. And it chronicles cholera and this sort of epidemic and using research to tell the story and research that made a difference and saved thousands of lives. What Jon Snow did that was fascinating is he decided, he noticed that people died I mean, very rapidly. People all over the street where he was and he was a doctor were dying. So he decided to go door to door and do research and find out how many people in a household died, how many people were sick, and, and where did they get it and what were some of their behaviors, their psychographics and their demographics. And then he plotted it all on this map. And as you can see, here's a picture of the map there. Each of the little dots represents a death within one of the households. Uh, this is, in the green part, is where you see the biggest spread of cholera. Uh, and what they tracked it to, and what he tracked it to, was a single well on Broad Street, the Broad Street well. And what he found out is that everyone who came in contact with cholera had contracted it through the well. Why that is important is because cholera previous to that was believed to be miasmic, which means that it's transmitted through air. In fact, when he went to the local council to say he believes it's in the water, they laughed at him. And he convinced them to pull the handle off of the Broad Street pump, and they did, which saved thousands of lives. In the blue part in the uh, magenta area is another well, the Marble Street well, and uh, people were not dying around there. The reason why people in the purple uh, with the houses that were impacted, that's because they had come in contact with the Broad Street well. Another indication that cholera was transmitted by the water is that one of the uh, breweries in the area that made beer, none of their 600 workers that lived very close to the well got sick. And that was because during that time, part of your wages was beer so they just drank the beer and didn't drink the water. So <laughs> here's a timeline of the cholera outbreak and, and what happened, and it was very fast. He saved thousands of lives. It's a very small outbreak compared to other outbreaks, and there's been many outbreaks since. So why am I telling you the story about cholera? Because I'm trying to prove a point that no matter what the topic is, there's a story to tell. Me sitting up here and citing facts about something like cholera isn't as impactful. Me telling you a story about cholera engages your brain. 
you're more likely to remember some of these details in the story I told you than some of the facts I gave you at the beginning of the talk. So let's talk about the brain and why do stories over stats engage your brain? Here's a great uh, tool, and what I tried to do in the story was use a combination of a narrative, visuals, and data. If you look at stories, when you're in some organization having those aspects, your story is more successful. If you have a data-driven story, it's not as successful as one that has narrative with it. If I told you the story of cholera without showing you the visuals of the ghost map, my story wouldn't have been as effective. Sometimes you don't need the data. Sometimes you can just tell a story. So let's talk about the brain and why this is the way it is. There are so many complex portions to the brain and understanding what the brain is. And it's really critical to us as communication people that we understand how the brain functions. Because no matter what research you do, what surveys you do, any sort of analysis, it's how the brain works that's going to be the most telling thing. The Broca and the Wernicke control the language comprehension and language production of the brain. That's important because that helps you when you're having a conversation understand where the other person is coming from. There's different parts of the brain, and recent research has shown that the brain isn't in isolation. You don't have one part of the function that does this and it operates in isolation. You really should look at the brain in the whole. But just to give you a brief summary, the reptilian part of the brain is the base core that mammals have. It, it um, regulates our temperature, our breathing, things you don't even think about sitting at this table right here. The next layer is the limbic brain, the emotional or feeling part of the brain. This is where some important brain components lie. The hypothalamus that produces oxytocin, the love hormone, which I'll talk about. You also have the amygdala, the emotion part of the brain that allows you to trust people, to empathize with people, and develop relationships in this part. And the neocortex, that is the rational thinking part of the brain where decisions are being made. All these components of the brain impact how you receive stories and how you interact with others. Your brain is also releasing chemicals. And the most important chemical, there's all sorts of chemicals, endorphins, that runner's high, uh, serotonin, which is the feeling to comfort those feelings of loneliness. But the one I'm going to talk about today is oxytocin. This is Paul Zak. He's a professor at Claremont Graduate School in the US. And he, his license plate actually says oxytocin, which is interesting. <laughs> but he's holding a heart because he is a specialist in oxytocin, the love hormone, or they also call it the moral molecule. They did some very interesting research where they wanted to see what is the impact of oxytocin on certain things in your brain and your ability to listen to stories. So what they did is they told a story and then they told a different story. One story was very emotion-driven, it was very full of information. The other one was not. It was just data, facts, that sort of thing. What they found is that those who listened to the emotion story were more likely to donate money to a nonprofit than those who didn't. And they could measure that in the level of oxytocin in their brain. And they were able to. Because now you can measure oxytocin without having to have an invasive procedure. So let's talk about the science and art of storytelling. One thing I'll tell you is beware of popular research that is misleading. This was a popular study conducted by Microsoft where they said that the intention span of a human is shorter than a goldfish. Have any of you heard this? Yes. That is not true. <laughs> that is not true. So what that has done and what that has caused is that people think we, the, and I hear it all the time from even my trustees, we have to create content that is snackable, something very short. We just do a burst, and then because that's the only way people can get attention spans. That is not true. Think about the stats on Netflix. How many of you are Netflix people? Yes, wow. How many of you binge watch on Netflix? Yes, you do. Any uh, Ozark people here? Ozark people, Ozark? Yes, yes. I haven't watched it, I'm going to. Think about Netflix. Do you have a problem with attention span with Netflix? Do you find yourself staying up late at night watching too much TV and watching the next episode? That's called a nudge, by the way. 
they show next episode starting in three seconds and you're like, I can have 20 more minutes to watch one more episode. Yes, you do it. Science people, that's a nudge. <laughs> that's behavioral science they're getting you. There's also a term called binge racing. Have any of you heard the term binge racing? These are the people that watch the entire episode of a show as, or entire season of a show as soon as it comes out. And so instead of binge watching it, they literally sit down and watch it all the way through in a very short period of time. Podcast, Netflix, YouTube, Twitch, people spend a lot of time watching these programs. Goldfish, no thank you. Here's benefits to stories. Empathy with oxytocin, they persuade and help us learn. They simulate situations because we have something called mirror neurons. That means when I'm watching something on TV, I'm feeling the emotions. I'm mirroring behavior, I'm mirroring the feelings with the neurons. So what you have to do is attention, I mean, get attention, develop tension. You bring the emotions of the characters. People are people, they want to feel somebody else in the story. So here's what you need to do. Think about the imagery of the story. You also need it to be realistic so people can put themselves in your shoes. You have to isolate the outside information that they may have that's coming into their world to disrupt from the message you're trying to send. If people know that you're trying to persuade them, you lose some of their attention. So just know that. If you're a company and you're trying to sell a car and you're telling a story, people in the back of your minds know that you're trying to sell something. That's not a bad thing. There's nothing you can do, but just be aware of that. Here's what Paul Zak subscribes to, and that's Freitag's dramatic arc of storytelling. So it's basically what you hear in like an English composition class, where you start off with the background, you move to some rising action, some climax falling action, and then you have to have a conclusion. When you don't have a conclusion, people feel like they're empty and there's something missing. So here's the things you can take away and what you can do. Character-driven stories. You have to have content that is emotional, that releases those oxytocin levels. Ditch the PowerPoint and tell a story. If you're ever speaking to an audience, tell your story. But tell a story. Instead of saying, here's how this epidemic is affecting, tell the story of someone who has had been impacted. And then things there, so ask important questions. Think of, always think about the other in the audience. Why should your readers care? Why do they want to be compelled with a story? And do the research. If you hear a stat like goldfish have a longer attention, we know that's it just sounds a little silly, but it's something that's been sort of perpetuated. But do the research and understand what's going on, and that's why it's important to learn about the brain and what the brain can do. So this is the last slide, but here's other things that when you have data and you're trying to get people with data, make sure you have a story with it so you can connect with the audience. That's very critical. And reduce the numbers to make it easier to understand. Instead of saying five million people are affected by X, instead say, one in 10 people in this room will be impacted by X. Make it personal, say, and ask questions like, how many people in this room have done this? You obviously are uh, watching a lot of Netflix. Um, and big, make it a human interest story. So thank you. Tina, thanks so much for those um, fascinating stuff. And you know, as we were talking earlier, I think um, very interested in data myself and um, the science behind storytelling. But I think before we get into sort of academic stuff, I think from a perspective, given, the, given where we are in the room, and you know, given the fact that a lot of these guys are either representing brands directly or are talking to um, brands through their agencies, right? I think how do we realign or, or, or sort of reset the way storytelling is looked at, right? And we would, again, because a lot of these guys, their success metrics are based on um, media outcomes, for example. Right? But this is, not, this is not what we're saying. We're, over here, we're saying talk directly to the consumer. Right, so how do they sell that story internally? I mean, what's your advice to them? Yeah, I think if you're doing storytelling for storytelling's sake, like we have to tell our story without like, why are we doing it? I think it comes off a little thin. Mm -hmm. So I think for companies, it's taking a step back and really understanding who you are, who you want to be, and how can your strategies and tactics sort of make that Come fulfill together. the brand promise. If you're also contributing to what I call content pollution, if you're just trying to put out a video to just put something out there, and that's, it really is polluting content, I think that's also the wrong way to do it. I think when you do tell a story, it has to be very authentic, it has to be honest, and it has to really represent 
the core brand, who you are, and you do it not to storytell for storytelling's sake, but really because you're trying to help your customer, help your employees, or help somebody who's at the end of that message. And, and, I, and I guess then the larger question becomes, how do you get the marketing manager or the communications manager or, or, you know, or the head of a department to see beyond the headlines or see beyond the, the retweets or see beyond the likes, right? Um, and, and how do you get them to buy into this philosophy? And I guess that's the problem, that's the practical sort of problem that a lot of uh, you know, our colleagues would face. Yeah, I think it's then it's a matter of the metrics. Like if you're just trying to get retweets and likes, which is it's also very good because if you have a great video and great story and you have a lot of people sharing it, mm -hmm. well, that's really good for the organization too. It's really proving, and a lot of it's the research. If you, a lot of research shows why storytelling is important. If you look at Dr. Zach's research, he has data that shows how storytelling can improve the donations to your nonprofit. So if you take this data and take the research, and because academics have done a lot of research mm -hmm. testing X or testing Y, and to get those, there, it's not though, it's not accessible. It's not like, you know, in the New York Times you open it up. Okay. But if you read like Harvard Business Review and do access some of the journals, you can make a case for why this is how it should be. And not only that, to make an investment. So at IPR, we just started this series called In a Car with IPR. And um, we're actually not in cars yet. <laughs> We've been in airplanes. We're going to be in a helicopter. We were on uh, scooters last week in Washington, D.C. But what it, what our trustees were like, we need to do more videos. And they have to be short. You have to have short videos. No one's going to watch a long video, right? Because this is sort of what they hear. And I'm like, wait, that's not true. And so we decided to uh, come up with this in a car series, which is very engaging. It's very interactive. Yeah. And so we may fail. But we're going to try it. And if it doesn't work, we'll just pivot and do something else. So, yeah. Which sort of leads me to my next question is that in an, in an age of increasing noise, and you said, you know, you, you called it pollution, attention spans, were, while they're not reducing necessarily for opt in content, like Netflix, for example, like I want to watch Netflix, but for sort of content that's, that's coming to me organically, right? Um, so what are your thoughts there on the formats that are working? What are you seeing that actually helps get someone to that point of, you know, um, like that social critical mass? Yeah, I think it's a matter of, it's first understanding your audience and who they are and what they want from you. And I mean, sometimes you can make your audience want something from you they didn't even know. Steve Jobs was great about this. When they did the iPad test, everyone hated it. And he goes, they don't know what they want, this is new. I'm gonna make them want the iPad, right? But with um, the, the stories, it's a matter of knowing who your audience is. So if you are Southwest Airlines and you're trying to communicate um, to pilots, how do they wanna get the story from you and the message? Because they're, they're all over the place. Do they want something in video? Do they want something that's more of an audio they can listen to? So it's understanding the audience, what they want, but it's also not putting out content that's garbage. Because if you're producing these videos, if you want, don't want to watch your own video, by the way, no one else wants to either. And I've seen this even in some industry groups. They produce these podcasts. And even I talked to somebody, and they were like, we don't even watch. We don't even listen to our own podcast. If you're not listening to your own podcast or watching your videos, you need to do something else. <laughs> because if you're not wanting to watch it, no one else would either. So I think it's a matter of you know, figuring out what do they want and what can you give them. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask a question on our behalf and, and to the audience and, and, and just to see a show of hands in terms of how many people here in the audience have actually done like e even as even a cursory exercise at that in terms of a day in the life of uh, your target audience. If you've studied a day in the life of your target audience. And, 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 and you know, and, and, and something like that, like will, will like, do you want to talk about what a day in the life of is and maybe sort of, un, you know, sort of explain why something like that is incredible? Yeah, important. I mean, that's a great thing because um, I, well, you know, I watched this movie on a plane. I feel pretty. Has anyone seen I Feel Pretty? <laughs> anyone one of it? Okay, <laughs> there's like three people. Um, it's Amy Schumer and, uh, and it's, she works at some cosmetic company and they're trying to like roll out this diffusion line, which is sort of your, mm -hmm. uh, just what you buy at the store rather than like a high-end store. 
And the people at the top, they just didn't get it. They were like, I don't, they weren't selling it, it wasn't working because you had all these people who weren't connected to the core audience. And Amy Schumer comes in and she's like, why wouldn't, why don't you have a brush with your blush compact, right? She's like, people who shop at these stores. And it was all this information, but they've never thought of it. So putting yourself in the mind and, and really walk around with your customer. Pick a customer and say, hey, can I just follow you around for the day and just see, I know that sounds creepy, but like just really get to know them and talk to them. They're more than happy to tell you, but people have different habits and habits that they may not know themselves. And there's, I, there's a few theories I love, but um, one of them is people do things and they may not be conscious that they do it every day, right? Like I love going to Starbucks and I, I don't think I am cogn cognitively aware of my everyday Starbucks experience, but if they were saying, well, I would love to see, like, what do you think when you go into a Starbucks or app, why don't you walk us through it? I think that can have a big impact because you are biased as a member of the organization or as an agency working for a client and really understanding the day-to-day, -day, what they think about, what they care about, um, even their, their like family life and how they, they handle the, you know, we, I, saw, I saw these pro products for women and I feel like they're so out of touch. They're just like, I'm like, what? And they always have like, I'm a mom, I have three kids. And they're like all these mom stereotypes. And I'm like, this doesn't represent me at all, right? I mean, they always have these calm households and they're all cheery. I mean, my house is like, it's three kids, getting them out the door is so chaotic. But that's never really represented. And so if I was thinking of a brand, I'd really want the brand to speak to me and who I am. And they're more than happy to come in my house for a day and watch chaos unfold. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like those car commercials where the, where the driver is always happy. And always if you're in a car oh, full yeah. of kids, you're never happy. No, I know. And you're like, can we turn on like the DVD or something so they don't talk to each other or me either? <laughs> so, 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 you know, and, and which is also interesting because there are several brands out there that are successful in their own way, despite this lack of emotional connect, right? Is there a message there that you can be more successful if you understand or unlock this emotional connect? I definitely think so. And I'm glad you mentioned cars, because I, um, I wrecked my car two weeks ago. And uh, so my, um, my husband's actually going today to go test drive a car. And I set it up, and he's like, well, I'll wait for you to get home. I'm like, no, you can feel free. Like, just go drive it. If it works, get it. Because to me, like, car buying is a terrible experience. It just, it takes a lot of time. I just get frustrated, and he's going to do it. But if you think about, like, cars and the whole um, brands, mm -hmm. if you watch a lot of the commercials, and when you're in the, when, I'm, I had a very small window. I just wrecked my car two weeks ago. I've been traveling. So I'm like, I don't know what kind of car to get. I don't know, like, so I did research on it, first of all, and then you start noticing all the cars around you, right? I start looking at all the cars, I'm like, mm hmm um, But what happens is you start noticing, like, car advertising and mm -hmm. commercials, and they get it wrong. Like, they just show you, like, the features of the car, and it's always going really ridiculously fast on a freeway, right? And it's just, they all just run together, and they're like, here's the hood, and look how sleek it is. I don't care how sleek the hood is. Like, I care if my kids can touch each other in the back seat. Like, are they gonna be able to touch each other in the back seat, right? And do I have a backup camera so I don't hit the car behind me, which uh, that could happen too. So it's, it's really, so if I'm somebody and I'm, the, I'm like, and my husband and I agreed on what kind of car to get, but if I'm like the primary sort of, like mm -hmm. how do you appeal to yeah. me and how do you get to know yeah. me? Yeah. Because I want the emotional stories. I, so a perfect example, car commercials, the ones that really get me as a parent are the ones that are safety ratings. So when you have commercials that feature the safety of the car or show a bunch of people in the car like families, that gets me, especially yeah. when you have actual, actual people, not actors, tell a story of how their lives were saved by a car. Those to me are so powerful <clears throat> versus these canned where they walk in a room and they're like, this is the GMC truck? And they're like so fake and you're like, I, this doesn't make me want to buy a car. So I think getting to know the stories and how real people use those services and products, that's where it gets to the, the emotion part. So any car manufacturers in the audience, you know how to sell a car to Tina now? Yes, but if you have any car <laughs> people, I'm taking donations, anyone? Cars? No? Okay. <laughs> but, but let's throw it over to the audience and let's take some questions. Do we have mics around? And, um, anyone for a question with Tina? Put your hand up, we'll get the mic to you. Come on. <laughs> 
Don't give her the mic. Wait, what are they? <laughs> she can ask me questions all the time. <laughs> Hi, Tina. This is Sarup. Uh, Hi, Sarah. Nice to meet you. I think my question is around, you talk about a very important thing about storytelling, but how would that differ in a, in a cultural context, especially when we talk about fear in storytelling? How would culture and the societal implications would impact the storytelling? That's a great question. So she asked about culture and how that impacts storytelling. It has everything to do with storytelling, right? So you have to understand, and there's different things in the culture that you have to respect and make sure you understand when you come in, but the brain, regardless of the culture, works very similarly. The releasing of the oxytocin, and people vary on their levels of oxytocin, and people vary on their levels of serotonin, which they found actually people who um, have imbalances, it affects like depression and other things. But culture plays a huge role in understanding the culture and being sensitive to the culture has a big impact. So um, I, I think that's very valid, especially here, and that's why I try to be super careful when I was even doing research on this presentation that I made sure that Netflix was here in <laughs> India because I don't want to come in here like Netflix and you're like, I don't know what she, but she's just coming in here talking about American stuff. Um, so I think you have to be very sensitive to the message when you come to the, the different places. I'm just really excited that so many people um, watch Netflix, as I do, as well. <laughs> you a mic here on the left-hand side as well. Um, I'll just pass the mic, but I have a question for you, Tina. I'm Akshita from The Practice. Um, you know, research can be mostly uh, data or statistics. What would your advice be to storytellers when they are converting that research into stories? What are the couple of you know, cautionary advice that you may have for us? Yeah, so that's where it's combining sort of the research. Because I'm a, re I'm a I'm, if you're asking me if I'm more quantitative or qualitative, I'm definitely more quantitative. I'm more numbers driven than anything else. But it's finding the balance and supporting the stories with the research. So if you're going to tell people that 130 million people die of cholera every year, why does it matter to them and why do they care? And that's where the story really comes in and the impact. Um, but don't forget the research. I know I talked a lot about using research and storytelling, but don't forget to include the data. But always think about why should they care and how can I make it matter to them. Yeah, and it's also about ensuring that you put it in a context that makes it simpler. Right, because I think data uh, tends to exactly. overwhelm people. Exactly, and as an ac a former academic, that is so true, because if I was up here spouting off theories and stuff, you know, you have to break it down to simplicity, because here's what happens in your brain. You try to collect the least amount of information as possible. Your brain doesn't have the capacity to take in everything. You're not thinking like, how many squares are in this room? I'm gonna count all these together. Is this a mathematical formula? Look at the way the lights did. That's so much information. Your brain takes her heuristics or shortcuts. And that's why, that's why if you look at what you do on a daily basis, there are things you do, you know, whether it's like brushing your teeth, you don't think about like up and down, up and down, back, 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 because your brain can't handle it. So these shortcuts and helping people make the information easier, because once you start talking and you lose them with over-research, like they've tuned out and it's hard to get them back. Let's go there, right, last question. Hi, Tina, my name Hi. is Girish from On Purpose. Uh, I have a very tactical question. Sure. As somebody who's helping clients manage their budgets on communications and storytelling, do you have any sort of advice on the optimal percentage that we should be putting aside for research from a communications budget? You know, it's really sad, but a lot of times, whenever people have, um, they need to cut the budget, they'll choose the research, which is the biggest mistake. Um, usually I would say about 20% should go to research, if I was gonna, but that's not always true. There's a lot of great secondary research, like research you get on sites or some sources that is really beneficial and helpful. Um, but the research component is so absolutely critical, and I'm glad you asked that, because it saves you money and it saves you time. Um, we, I mean, we've done research on audiences where we found out, we were like, people just aren't aware of who we are, not IPR, but in a client I used to have, people aren't aware of who we are. And then you find out, if we, through research, they know who you are, they just don't like you. <laughs> so, so that is a completely different campaign. And so when you have a campaign, if you don't do the upfront research, you're wasting like time and 
money, and, and you can do research nowadays, you can do research so fast. Like you can get a survey in the market in like overnight and do a quick study and get things out and it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. You don't have to do a dissertation, you know, or something like that. We're out of time, Tina, but thank you so much. And yeah, thank you, you all for having me and thanks to Praxa. I mean, this has been great experience, thank you.